thank you very much. So, uh, yeah, so finally we got through normalization. It was uh, three lectures and uh, finally we got there. Uh, okay, so just to recall you, so we constructed the S matrices. So you know that those S of V were V was a regular functional, but what we actually need is S matrices, but for V local functional. So local functionals. Okay, and so this is the renormalization problem. So first of all, uh, let me recall you the definition. So S of V was defined as a time-ordered exponential of I over H bar T of V. And in other words, you can write it as T of E to I over H bar V. And this guy here, so this was the time ordering map. And T was given in terms of the Feynman propagator. So T was the exponential H bar delta Feynman D over D phi squared. And the difficulty is that the Feynman propagator is rather singular. So if I try to apply this map to local functionals, then I get into trouble. So the first step uh, in trying to renormalize this formula is actually dealing with how T should act on, uh, so maybe I should say here, uh, not just local functionals, but more generally multi-local functionals, multi-local functionals. So the first step I can uh, try to uh, define T on local functionals. So first step, so how does T act on local functionals? From this formula, uh, if we want to apply it to regular ones, uh, the only functional which is both, well, regular and local would be an affine functional, so a constant one or a linear one. This is a second derivative, so if I have something which is both regular and local, hence linear, then uh, this actually acts trivially. So note, so the first step is define T on F lock and uh, observation that for the intersection of regular and local, which is just affine functionals, we have that uh, T restricted to affine functionals is just the identity because it has uh, it's written as identity plus uh, things that require a derivative uh, higher than one. Okay, so obviously it's identity on the fine things. So I can now uh, the, the obvious choice here for extending t to f log is to say that t is actually identity on f log. So that's the choice I'm going to take. So choice, we set T on F block to be the identity. And there are other choices, and actually this corresponds to uh, a choice of ordering. So uh, this is really secretly a choice of ordering. That's the most obvious one. So now 
uh, what am I left with? So in that formula here, I now want to define, to define S of V. Uh, so if I assume uh, that uh, T is identity on local functionals, then this should be just I over H bar V or V local. Okay, so now uh, I just have this time ordered exponential. I write this in terms of Oh, just maybe to be pedantic, let's put here the coupling constant lambda. So I have lambda i over h bar to the n. So now I need to be able to handle n-fold time-ordered products of local functionals. I denote this guy by tn, tn of v tensor n. So my problem is now reduced to finding these coefficients in uh, the Taylor expansion of the exponential. So, uh, I'm left with the question how to get this map. So the remaining problem So define maps T n going from the n fold time or the sorry the n fold tensor product of f log. Uh, the target of it I can already spoil the game is going to be microcausal functional. So something I introduced in the last lectures with some very nice wavefront set conditions. And formal power series, uh, well, yeah, just formal power series in H bar. Uh, so we are after those maps, uh, and they are called n-fold time-ordered products. Product. And the construction of those things is covered by epstein glaser renormalization. So construction, this is epstein glaser renormalization. Okay, so the first observation that I'm going to use in that story is that uh, there is actually a domain in this tensor product where TNs are already well defined without any uh, cheating involved. So again, observation. So if I take N functionals with disjoint supports, so for F1 to Fn, which are local with pairwise disjoint supports, then, or I should start it with four, four, uh, such functionals, you can write Tn of F1 to Fn as follows. So we have another exponential type uh, map. So here I will write it maybe larger because this gets confusing. So here we have a sum from over I less than j between one and n. And here we take the Feynman propagator and the derivatives are with respect to phi i and, sorry, 
that's delta pi i and delta pi j. And this is then applied to f1 of pi 1. This is just the usual pointwise product fn of pi n and evaluate it. So here, that should be at point phi. Evaluate it at pi 1 equals pi n equals phi. So this is now, uh, well, okay, so algebraically this is clear. I think that it should work, right? So I'm just uh, using the fact that for the n-fold time ordered product, the way it is defined, I'm just taking uh, contractions between um, different arguments with uh, taking derivatives and then contracting with the Feynman propagator. Now, uh, the interesting fact here is that if these supports are really disjoint, then uh, this is also well defined uh, as a product of distribution. So there are no functional analytic problems with that. So for F1 and Fn with disjoint support, this is well defined. Okay, so, so I know how to multiply things with disjoint supports. But this is obviously not enough because here uh, in the end game, I want to evaluate it on n copies of the same functional. So obviously that's not going to satisfy the condition with disjoint supports. So uh, now I reduce my problem even further. So uh, I want to extend these TNs to uh, arguments with arbitrary support, knowing how they act for the disjoint support situation. Okay, so the way I'm going to start this is uh, by setting up uh, the epstein glaser axiom. So I'm going to tell you what are the properties I want from those TNs, and then I will show that uh, well, existence. Uh, that existence is by construction, so that's uh, at least uh, partially relief. So I'm looking for a family of the ends, so such that. And let's get started. So uh, the first property, T1, uh, is something I already, uh, well, sort of announced uh, last lecture, which is causal factorization. So I told you that S matrices satisfy causal factorization. So uh, this is very crucial. And I want this also to hold for the, the renormalized S matrix. So this is causal factorization property. So this says if I have uh, F1 to Fn such that I can split them into two groups, so such that supports of F1 to let's say uh, fk are not to the past of supports of fk plus one to support fn. If I'm in that situation, then I want my product to factorize. So Tn of F1 to Fn should factorize as the k-fold time ordered product of F1 to Fk. And now here I have the star product. So that was the 
operator product, the non-commutative product of the game, and here t n minus k of f k plus one to f n. Okay, so that's uh, that guarantees the causality. So that's the first property. Uh, now, P2 is sort of boring. It sets up uh, the starting point of what's going to be a recursive procedure. So uh, I want T0 to be one and T1 to be identity. Is there a question? Oh, okay. Uh, T3, this is symmetry. Okay, so I'm in the bosonic theory, so I want these maps to be symmetric. So uh, the ends is symmetric. or graded symmetric if we have also fermions in the presence of fermions, okay? Uh, and now our more important ones, so T4 is called field independence. And what does it say? So let me write it in a slightly formal notation. So I want the derivative with respect to the field of Tn of F1 to Fn be the same as now the situation where I pull the derivative past Tn. So this is the sum i equals one to n Tn, and here I'm just differentiating one of these guys. So d f i over d phi. that field independence. Uh -huh. Okay, I will continue the axioms here so that I have everything in one board. So just remove this. Both of these guys. Okay, so I will continue this side. So that's T four, T five. Slightly technical, so we are working with formal power series, so uh, which maybe is not <laughs> apparent, but um, we want a certain behavior uh, of these functions with respect to what well, we want uh, some consistency between the Taylor expansion and this formal power series. So let me denote uh, f. N, uh, the Taylor series expansion up to order N, okay? So then the rest is cut off. Uh, so we have this T5, which for some reason it's called phi locality. No idea why. Um, 
which says that Tn of F1 to Fn is equal to Tn of these uh, Taylor series expansions up to order n plus terms which are of the order h bar n plus one. So this is kind of useful because we have here uh, this formal power series in h bar and we know then that for a given order in h bar we only care about um, well, the finite Taylor series expansion of these functionals. So these functionals are, uh, in general, some analytic maps, but we actually don't ever need the full series. We just need it uh, for a fixed order. Uh, and almost there. So P6 is unitarity. So that's an important one. So Tn of F1 to Fn is, uh, so now I want to complex conjugate everything. So complex conjugate this and complex conjugate that. What happens, this, um, oh, so that should go like that. That replaces Tn with the anti-time ordered product. So F1 to Fn, so this Tn is the anti-chronological product. And uh, it's defined in such a way that it guarantees that um, essentially the inverse of the S matrix is given by its complex conjugate. So this Tn, uh, yeah, that's a bit of a messy notation. So Tk of F1 through Fk. So these are then essentially coefficients of the inverse uh, of the S matrix. Let me just write it in words. Um, our coefficients of uh, Let me start this again. Change of product. So these are coefficients of uh, S of V minus one, and this inverse is with respect to the star product. So this is star inverse. So this will guarantee that uh, this S matrix that you get at the end is unitary with respect to the star product. So, so S of V is unitary with respect to star. Uh, okay, and there is also some notion of covariance, but uh, I'm not going to talk about it. Let me just write it here for completeness. So E7 is covariance, and I'm going to skip it for now. Okay, so here are the axioms, and I'm interested in constructing uh, these uh, T ends such that those guys are satisfied and the procedure is to go inductively in N and use uh, the fact that everything up to order N satisfies these axioms and then proceed. Okay, so I want to spend the rest of time 
in uh, telling you something about that explicit construction. So I will free the other board. Okay, any questions? No questions, great. Everybody got lost. Uh, eh? I don't? Okay. <laughs> um, well, these are maps of uh, formal power series. So, um, yeah, I mean, uh, not really, but uh, I mean, if in, in the non-perturbative setting, I definitely would. So, um, yes, the TN is not identity. The TN is given by uh, the formula I raised before I wrote this. Yes, yes. Yes, yes. So all these things are satisfied for, um, yeah, the, the, the explicit formula I gave at the beginning. That's correct. Yes. So, uh, so far, so good. Yeah, I'm, I'm actually right. So uh, maybe that's a good, good uh, stage to impose some analyticity. Uh, I will impose analyticity for local functionals since Harold uh, mentioned it. So why not now? Um, so just to make things uh, transparent, uh, I'm going to work with local functionals. Of the form. Uh, f of phi, uh, as I denoted, f alpha of phi is an integral of some function alpha of x d mu. Okay, so, uh, and I want this function here to be a uh, analytic function of uh, the jet j n of phi. So I want an, a finite jet. Uh, this guy is just the volume form, uh, the volume form, form associated with the metric. of the manifold I'm working on. Uh, th this assumption here is not uh, super relevant for um, perturbative setting because T5 actually guarantees that I never really care about all of the Taylor expansion. I only need uh, always finitely many terms. Uh, but okay, just... Just, there is no real reason to, to, co to consider things that are non-analytic here. So, uh, let's do that. So I want in the first instance to uh, use some of these uh, properties to simplify my construction. And first thing I want to get rid of is the dependence on phi. 
So I'm going to use T4 and T5 to get rid of phi dependence. Okay, so uh, let me first re review something I did for the classical theory and it actually becomes relevant. So recall, when I was computing the derivative, so first derivative of this thing here in the direction of psi, if I want to compute it explicitly, I have this very nice local form of this. Well, this alpha is actually, practically speaking, a function of uh, phi and its derivatives. So this is function of phi of x, d phi of x, and so on. So the usual thing, I did that calculation already. I can write it using uh, the Euler Lagrange derivative, the variational derivative. So this is where the notation gets horrible. Um, so, uh, yeah, let me try to get through this in one piece. So we have, so since everything factors through this alpha, so we can use the chain rule, and trust me, we can. Uh, so we have d over d, uh, oh, let's see. Yeah, so we have the uh, derivative of alpha with respect to the phi, then we have, uh, so this is, uh, yeah, at some point uh, here, so integrated with psi of x. Then uh, the next thing, we have the derivative uh, of alpha with respect to the derivative, so d mu of phi of x, and here I have to flip the sign and do the integration by parts trick. So I already did that calculation before. Times psi of x and so on. D mu of x. So that's definitely one way of writing it. But that is not the best way of writing it, in fact. So I'm going to write this slightly differently. So, alternatively, okay, so I can refrain from integrating by parts, and then I will have here uh, essentially polynomials in phi and its derivatives, and polynomials in psi and its derivatives. Let me do that instead. So I can write this f1 alpha of phi in the direction of psi uh, as a sum, well, as the integral, and then the sum over some multi-indices. And here I have d alpha over d uh, sum derivative of phi. Um, let's say of x, and here I have the same derivative acting on psi of x. Okay, and everything is then um, integrated. So in the first derivative, if I don't, uh, so this is multi-index, if I don't, uh, integrate by parts, then I have this uh, expansion. So I sort of split my polynomial into uh, two pieces. So this is a uh, oh, polynomial in phi, and this is polynomial 
phi, d phi, and so on, and this is polynomial in psi, d psi, and so on. And now I want to do a more general thing, so I want to write my whole Taylor expansion in this way. So uh, here we go. So for the Taylor expansion, Uh, so let's see, so we have f alpha of phi plus psi, so now I have to write it as a big sum. Uh, and what do we have here? So we will have um, these uh, sum, have a sum, we have an integral, and we will have uh, some kind of uh, derivatives with respect to now um, more than one variable, so this is going to get extremely complicated. Uh, so, okay, uh, let, let, let me try to maybe simplify it a bit. So, so in the first instance, this is alpha of x, of phi plus psi, okay? And now I want to expand this alpha of x uh, in the Taylor expansion, d mu of x. So now expand this. Okay, so I want to think of various uh, ways to uh, distribute these terms in the alpha of x, which is uh, written in terms of uh, the function and its derivatives between functions of phi and functions of psi. So uh, I'm actually trying to say that secretly I'm using a co-product structure for uh, these maps alpha of x. So uh, there's going to be some co-product So delta, which goes from um, maps on the configuration space to the second tensor product. And this coproduct is going to essentially control that expansion. Uh, so I want to write this as this co-product applied to alpha x, which is then a function of two arguments, uh, phi and psi, d mu of x. Okay, so that's, that's a much nicer way of thinking about it. And, um, I'm using this board because I want to leave the axioms uh, for future reference. Okay, so what I'm going to do now, I want to uh, compute a, a very simple example of that co-product, okay? So in, maybe first of all, uh, yeah, in this, uh, in this Wheeler notation, we then have co-product of alpha is some uh, sum of alpha, x, um, that should be one of phi alpha x two 
of psi, okay? And an example, example, so let's take alpha of x of pi as pi to the fourth, so pi to the x to the power four, that's complicated enough. So uh, I have now uh, this thing to compute to this, right? So this should be by definition uh, alpha of x of pi plus psi. So I will compute this explicitly and then you will see that we really have uh, this kind of structure. So alpha x of pi plus psi. Well, this is easy, right? I have to take phi, phi of x plus psi of x and take the fourth power. So I use the binomial theorem. Um, so this is binomial theorem. So undergraduate material. Uh, so I have a term where I have only psi, then I have the term uh, where I have uh, pi of x, psi of x to the third, then um, I have both squares, so psi of x squared pi of x squared, and then uh, Psi of x cubed, psi of x, and then psi of x to the fourth. So this is a very simple example of how this uh, co-product looks like for polynomials. And the only thing that happens uh, is that, well, for derivatives, you also have, uh, well, polynomials in pi and its derivatives. And in principle, you can also have analytic functions so this series could become infinite, um, but uh, yeah, it's, it's nothing else but, but just a co-product underlying the uh, Taylor expansion. Okay, cool, so we have that, and this allows me to uh, write things in a slightly nicer way, uh, because I already got uh, annoyed with the notation. So now I want to use which one was that? T, T4, T4, to write the following. So I have uh, the time ordered product of F1 to Fn, and then uh, each one of them would be of the form um, integral of alpha i d mu. So now I want to use this uh, fact that time ordering commutes with derivatives and I want to insert the Taylor expansion for each one of these. So this is using the Taylor expansion. Okay, so this becomes now a uh, sum. Let's see if I have enough room. Probably, okay. So I have a sum over the ways to expand alpha one, to the ways to expand alpha n. I have Tn as a function of these, uh, well, the first, answer argument here. So this is T11 uh, of X1. Uh, no, I probably don't have enough space, sorry. I should clean up more. The problem with long formulas. So let me remove the example and let me just write this final thing. Okay. So.
non-canonical use of the blackboard space. Okay. And this is an unholy mess. So Tn of alpha one V mu to alpha n V mu is now the sum over all the ways to expand alpha one, all the ways to expand alpha n integral. And now I have Tn, which takes this first argument from the tensor product of all these things, alpha n one of xn. Okay, this I can evaluate at any point, but I will evaluate it at zero because it's the easiest thing to do. And now this is multiplied by the second argument here. So all these alpha two of x one of pi to alpha two to x n of pi and finally d mu. Okay, okay, that's uh, that's a long formula. Uh, what's important here uh, is this structure. So we do the Taylor expansion. These guys are inserted to this uh, time ordering pairing, and these guys are then left alone and don't contribute. So in this way of writing things, well, these are just some uh, polynomials or maybe analytic functions in phi, okay? These are uh, known. So what remains to be done is to make sense out of this thing, but this doesn't have phi's anymore. So this is just, I can denote it as Tn of alpha one to uh, alpha n, okay? And it's some distribution in n arguments. So this is distribution on mn. Okay, so now my problem uh, of defining Tn's has been reduced to the problem of finding uh, this uh, distributions. And I know that distribution everywhere outside uh, the uh, diagonal or the diagonals. So I know this, know this everywhere. outside um, diagonals. And this is how one does things in, uh, in practice. So uh, one works with those distributions, which then only depend on, uh, well, we call it weak monomials. So uh, we think of this expansion as the Wick expansion, and then uh, we call these things Wick monomials. For some good reason, which is probably related to what Frederick was talking about. Uh, okay, cool. So uh, what am I missing? I'm missing one thing. Uh, so here I use the particular way of writing uh, a functional as um, some function of the jet on the jet space times uh, a density. So I use a particular presentation of a local functional in terms of uh, some function on the jet space. Now, what can happen is that uh, I have some derivatives inside and I 
could uh, move them around in the way uh, which, well, you know, normally you can integrate by paths. So I want my construction to be independent of the way I present local functionals in terms of those analytic functions on the jet space. So there's going to be one extra thing I have to require if I want to work with those lowercase ends. Remove the axioms. So the last thing I want to require which is now the eight, which is called action word identity, which says that these little TNs commute with derivatives. So the mu, say, with respect to uh, xi of tn, uh, say, uh, uh, let's put generic names to those, L1 of x1 to Li of xi to Ln of xn. So this is the same as Tn of L1, X1, and I can pull this inside. So D mu, Xi, Li, Xi, Ln of Xn. So my uh, definition of Tn does not depend on the way I represent F alpha in terms of alpha and d mu. Okay, so I can move derivatives between these two uh, building blocks. Right, uh, okay, cool. So everything else, all the other axioms for capital TNs uh, translate to axioms for these little TNs. And then one sets up uh, a recursive procedure. So now construction. So use uh, T T1 to, uh, oh, sorry, that was capital T. Use T1 to uh, reduce the problem of constructing each Tn to an extension of a distribution and defined uh, outside diagonals, some configuration of diagonals. Actually, right, probably 
uh, yeah, if you do it right, then outside the total diagonal. In MN. Okay, so that's the fun. Um, I'm not going to give details of that because I don't have another lecture, uh, but I just wanted to give you an overview uh, how one gets there. Um, how much time do I have? Seven minutes, okay. So I have just enough time to tell you what's a renormalization group. So if I run this procedure, I get the existence of time-ordered products, but uh, there is no uniqueness. So these extensions are not unique, and the non-uniqueness is then governed by uh, the action of the renormalization group. So I can define here Stickelbeck Peterman renormalization group group. So these would be maps uh, from F block formal power series to F block. Uh, invertible in the sense of formal power series uh, such that and here are again some properties so uh, so maps Z Z of zero is zero Z uh, oh that's a separate one okay this is Z2 uh, Z of oh, the first derivative, sorry, the first derivative at zero is identity uh, Z3. It says that uh, Z is actually identity plus something of order of H bar. So these are early standard. Uh, this one's interesting. So Z4 is something that guarantees uh, going forward causal factorization. So this is another instance of this Hammerstein property. Z of G uh, plus Z of G plus H for uh, support F, support H is joint. Uh, and there is another one, uh, which I'm going to write here, Z5 is, uh, again, the field independent. So dZ over uh, d5 is zero. Uh, and what do they do for me? They actually uh, control these various ways of uh, extending the time-ordered products. So here is a theorem, which is also known as the main theorem of renormalization. Which says that uh, if I have T and T tilde, two extensions, of, or maybe I should say differently. So these are two renormalized time ordered products, two. renormalized time ordered products uh, then we have 
at the time ordered exponential with respect to one is related to the time ordered exponential with respect to the other by some element of this renormalization group. Ah, uh, then. That, and also the converse is true. So if I have a Z, uh, an element of this renormalization group, then, uh, okay, sorry, maybe that's probably a better way of writing it. Okay, so the tilde one is related to uh, the one without tilde by applying this element of the randomization group. And conversely, if I have some element of the randomization group, then this, uh, I know that there exists some extension T uh, tilde such that this holds. So, and the converse is true. Okay. Um, that finishes my time and that finishes my series of lectures. So thanks for uh, listening. Thanks for the patience and uh, yeah, thanks for the conference. <laughs>
the structure of, of these TNs. So, so you can think of those as, as maps on trees, and then, um, ah, so, so there, is, there is this formula. You can then break it down and have the relation between, uh, say, TN here, and some combination of uh, Zs composed with Ts. And, and that this, yeah, you combine this with that and you get the forest formula. Yes. Yes. Yeah, well, I, I there, there, could, there could be, yeah. So first of all, you see anomalies in that uh, renormalization group. You can see like the scaling anomaly there. Yes. Oh, no, 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 because then it's really about the action of, of symmetries. So um, it's, and, and it's, not, uh, it's, not, it's not entirely trivial. So, so that paper of uh, Brunetti, Ditch, and Frenhagen, it actually discusses scaling anomaly. So, so you can have a look, they compute it uh, explicitly. And actually now we have a non-perturbative version of, of that uh, as well. But <laughs> I have only one lecture. <laughs> yeah, yeah, so there is a version of, of this uh, group also non-perturbatively. Yeah, yeah, that, yeah. <laughs> yes. I, I don't know who was first. Kurush? Kurush, okay. Yes. Oh, um, so, so here I was playing with those S matrices as these formal power series in local functionals. Now, uh, non-perturbatively, we can think of S matrices uh, as some abstract generators, which then uh, generate some big sister algebras, sister algebra, which we then uh, quotient by the various relations we want for the S matrix. So then we have a really big sister algebra, and then we have a, a group, which then uh, acts on these local functionals, and it induces some action on that big sister algebra. So, so that's more or less the story. So you can kind of abstract away from a concrete realization of these S matrices as formal power series and uh, yeah, the, think of the, the, the more, well, operator algebraic rendering of that. Uh, there is a link. Uh, the formal one. Uh, so, so in I would say in cases where you have um, convergence, so like sine Gordon model, say some integrable models where you have convergence, then yes. But in general, yeah. Well, I would love to do everything non-perturbatively, you know, from from scratch to to be able to kind of relate these two pictures uh, entirely. But okay. You sure? Okay. Yeah. Ah, okay. Uh, yeah, so I think I, I mentioned this briefly at the end of last lecture. So these, uh, these S matrices then generate the local algebras. So, uh, yeah. So the local algebras of a region is um, generated by S matrices of functionals in that region. So, so that's, that's actually, yeah. Uh, at, at the end, when I have constructed everything, that's the simplest step. Yes? Correct. Oh, yes, okay, so uh, another way of thinking about these time-ordered products 
is uh, in terms of factorization algebra. So uh, there is this approach of Costello and William where uh, you think in terms of factorization algebras. Um, so, so these TNs would then be related to the factorization product in that setting. So if you're familiar with that, then uh, yeah, with Owen William, we wrote the paper which kind of links these two perspectives. And at the moment we are finishing a paper which uh, also spells out how the randomization is uh, related in, in both things because they used they, they worked in Euclidean so they used a different approach to randomization but um, our approach to well Epstein Glaser approach to randomization also induces uh, a factorization algebra but this is not published yet <laughs> Well, the problem is that uh, you can make the algebraic side non-perturbative, so you can construct the algebra of observables, uh, but what we are missing is the construction of a state which is non-perturbative. Uh, and in constructive quantum field theory, you typically well, work in, in the vacuum representation. Right? So um, unfortunately, yeah, so what works great in a perturbative setting is that um, we, we have a perturbative construction of the interacting state from the free state. And free theory, you know, harmonic oscillator is the only thing we actually know how to solve. Um, thus, integrable models in lower dimensions. Um, but the link which is missing at the moment is uh, to have non-perturbative construction of the state uh, for this c algebraic framework. No, that, that's that's an excellent question. Um, yeah, so that that's actually one one the direction we are thinking about. So there is, um, well, I didn't talk about this non-perturbative formulation, but um, yeah, what's missing there is actually spectrum condition. But but we, we we're on it. We're on it. <laughs> Thank you.